Let me add one point to this too. You have Myanmar is one example, but you have more countries in transition right now from autocracy to something that is hopefully a little better than at any other time since 1989, and perhaps even more countries now than, than, than in 1989. And when you look at Libya, where we spent time, Tunisia, where we spent time, you know, the Afghanistans, the Myanmar's, all of these countries, you know, and, and the, the list goes on. South Sudan, which is the world's newest country, they're so busy, like just figuring out how to get this thing up and running because they hadn't had any institutions under dictatorship, the last thing they're thinking about is what the internet should look like. Now, I actually think in some respects that's good news because it means build it fast, build it open, get the population engaged, and by the time two or three years from now, they won't, be, they won't be able to run. They won't J be able to go back. Jared said, you know, the, the thing about Myanmar is that the generals decided to open it up, but the internet will make it op stay open that once you introduce these ideas and you empower the citizens, you cannot take it away from all of them. You just can't. And in the book, we actually talk about Egypt when they took it away during, during this, yeah. the uh, Arab Spring. The average Egyptian said, oh my god, this actually must be a real revolution. They're shutting off the internet. Right. And so all of a sudden, they switched sides, right? And they well, got uh, furious, too. Yes. What was right. interesting, I, I, was in Egypt the, the, I was in Egypt the day of the revolution, and it was interesting talking to, to young people on the street um, very few people that I talked to went there because they had been, you know, it, because it was a sort of premeditated decision. Almost every young person I talked to was so pissed off that Mubarak shut off the internet yes. that he yes. literally, you know, amplified the revolution in a way that one could actually argue had he not shut down the networks, he could have perhaps still been in power. Um, you know, again, there's no way to prove this, so therefore we can sort of assume I'm, I'm right. <laughs> Sounds good. Absolutely. Hi, I'm I'm Jeremy Zeiler. I'm a strategist at the New York Times, and uh, I have a question. But I wanted to ask you uh, about what you just said, which is in Egypt, what they did find, uh, from what everything I've read, is they did find that shutting down the internet actually caused people to take to the streets. And so, what a lot of countries and what a lot of the chatter has become is instead of shutting it down, you throttle the internet. You make it more difficult to handle. So instead of it taking one second for a page to load, it takes yes. 10 seconds. It, so it, you, you essentially have uh, an uprising of people who are hitting refresh and just waiting and like essentially slowing down the internet. It's like, yeah. it's like the glue, right? <laughs> and so like one of the, one of the things to, more to my question is uh, like uh, everything, it, it's all the openness and um, the excessive communication is wonderful except for the the, the bottlenecks, like the ISPs, um, the, the more and more uh, communication is going through centralized services. Um, and to what degree will those centralized services be the house for regulation? Uh, or will be, or will, you know, will, as regulation comes or as, as rules and laws come, like, is our ISPs kind of going to be controlling so, some of that? So uh, the book, in the book, we actually talk about the phenomena that the the dictator's handbook, the next version of the dictator's handbook is don't shut down the internet. Right. Instead, throttle it, make it look like it's working, delete people. Um, Jared points out that you could, in fact, have whole subgroups that you could sort of arbitrarily disadvantage. So you don't like the Kurds, you can give them a slower internet. It's like a digital right. ethnic cleansing. D so digital ethnic <laughs> cleansing, right? No, ser way. seriously. It's and and, and wow. we talk about this in the book at some, at some length. The technical answer to your question is that the internet, if you don't understand how it's exactly connected, is connected through a series of, of layers, essentially. And there's a set of large telcos that mm -hmm. switch your packets around, uh, which are generally interconnected globally through fiber and so forth. Um, people have looked very carefully at the capacity of that network, and that capacity is quite high. Um, the reason, of course, is there's an enormous amount of dark fiber. Uh, people are upgrading these links. There's a lot of money being made and so forth. The capacity issues in the Internet are in the last mile. <clears throat> and one of the issues is that this new generation of Netflix and YouTubes and all of those are using so much of the Internet for video, right, that it's becoming actually a significant amount of the video that's used on the Internet, which is, in, you know, a great thing. And people are working on that. So I'm not worried about the technical restrictions. I am worried about countries that decide to balkanize or otherwise restrict the ISPs. This is how China works. There are seven cross-connected networks within China. They all are cross-connected through an ISP, which has a proxy cache, which does the filtering. And that was done by design. That's in the plumbing. It, it was their, their evil design. Yeah. And, and, and if they're, you know, one of the issues, and, and um, you know, 
when Trish asked that question before, but one of the issues that seems of, with China is that if they're doing the the, um, the telco infrastructure in a lot of parts of Africa, for example, to get the, to do the extraction, yeah. then you can imagine exactly you can imagine the want. Chinese, excuse me, uh, extra, uh, taking their evil architecture and applying it to other countries in exchange for minerals, right? As an example, <laughs> and and by the way, the Chinese are not stopping still. Um, the next generation of these proxy caches actually does, uses something called machine intelligence to look for the encrypted traffic that people use to get around all the censorship, which are called VPNs, yes. and try to nail them. And so this game, it's, a, it's called a game of whack-a-mole. Literally, I move here, I move here, I move here, I move here, so I can get a real connection. Um, and they're not going to stop. That's a nice image with the uh, servers and the whack-a-mole. Yeah. <laughs> Just other questions? Got, oh, yes. OK, so we'll, do, we'll take a few more, and then I've got a final wrap-up. So we had one right here. If you pass the mic back quickly. Oh, you. They're, take it I away. I guess I got it first. <laughs> uh, Jared, this one's for you. I'm just curious uh, like about some details of the, your call to Twitter. Um, how many hours or minutes long is a, a scheduled maintenance uh, you know, sort of session? And also, um, or does it vary? Um, and also, what compelled you to say, you know, at what point was the momentum there? What day of the revolution was it that you said, like, let, let, let this flow, don't, don't, don't do the maintenance? Um, you'd be surprised how well I know the details of, of, of uh, the answer to this question, <laughs> just because when your job's on the line, you pay close attention and you sort of look through emails very carefully. Um, the other thing I learned is how quickly you can lose your job, um, which I didn't <laughs> in the end. Um, but uh, I think, you know, I, I'd heard about this, and it wasn't some kind of calculated plot. I wasn't like, oh, how can I undermine what the, the, the president said? It just sort of, you know, this is what... This is what you know, I was trying to do in policy. There was a lack of understanding about uh, Silicon Valley and technology and its role in geopolitics. I mean, it's so easy now, post-Arab Spring, to assume that there's always been an understanding that technology is important. When I came into to, to government in, uh, in 2006, you know, people called YouTube FaceTube. They called <laughs> Facebook, like, like you book. I mean, I, they, they, people just did not know what these things were. Um, and I'll actually, you know, this may not be a popular thing to say here, but I will give the Bush administration credit on this because they actually understood this in the last couple of years of the administration, in particular in the context of, uh, of, of Colombia. And so I don't know how long the, 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 the scheduled maintenance was, was a matter of hours, um, but the whole thing played out over the course of one day. It was the, uh, it was the second day after uh, the uh, election results came out. Uh, and the population decided that Ahmadinejad stole the election or the supreme leader stole the election on his behalf. Ouch. Aya. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Aya. I'm the founder of a toys company here in New York. Um, I'd love for you to talk a bit about what is, what you think is the future of um, uh, government corruption and government crime and government oppression in the digital age. Uh, historically, governments have um, that are oppressive have optimized for a small group of people at the top that wanted to optimize their wealth and their power. And so they carried out surveillance. They carried out um, a lot of sort of crimes uh, against, the, against their people. Um, today, and they had a lot of data on them. Today, Google has a lot more information about me than any government ever w was and, and would. Um, and information that probably could compromise me and, and could be used against me. Um, and Google is a, a public company, and so the fiduciary responsibility of the executives at Google could not align with what the, what's best for the people. So what happens when you have these situations where there's these new types of governments um, that have have to optimize for a small group of people um, and have all this power to do something that may not be good? Two separate questions. The Google question is easy. Um, we are very, very committed to your security and privacy. We fight very hard to make sure that subpoenas do not violate what we consider to be your privacy. Uh, and we take it very, very seriously. If we were to violate your privacy, you would lose, you would leave very quickly. And we have tools that make it easy for you to leave Google. So you're very much not trapped. And we're very aware of our responsibility. Um, with respect to the, the question of the elite, a simple argument is that any substantial amount of money is in digital form, and therefore it can be tracked. And the industries need to figure out a way to get those systems fully interconnected. But I'm quite convinced that a combination of digital tracking and then disclosure of public officials that, that is trackable and traceable by crowdsourcing would solve the majority of the, of the, of the corruption problems. 
uh, in the world. And it's a huge issue. When you go into these countries, the number one issue is not freedom of speech, yeah. it's corruption. Yeah. And Eric, since you largely took the Google and elite question, I'll try to tackle crime and, and, and a little more on, on corruption. Um, the, the key thing that, I mean, governments have been corrupt since the beginning of time. That's not going to uh, likely change. Um, what is going to change is the digital trail. So it's going to be impossible in the future to be corrupt and not leave more evidence, just because it's, you just can't be corrupt and disconnected from the internet, because like, how the hell are you going to do that from a cave? Um, and so as everybody, including corrupt officials, opt into using technology, they're going to leave a trail of evidence behind them. Now, if it were me and you wanted to map out the corruption, say, of the Iranian regime, I would come up with a fun project and call it Mullah Mansions. And I would essentially crowdsource all of the, the sort of property that the mullahs own, not just in Iran, uh, but in London, in Paris, in you know, different parts of Europe. And I would make it look like really fun and outlandish. And I would drive a wedge between clerics that live ostentatiously and those that don't. But I haven't thought about this at all. Um, the, uh, on, the, on the crime point, let me answer this by telling a, a story, which maybe doesn't answer your question, but I like the story. Uh, Eric and I, about a year ago, traveled to Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, uh, which is known as the murder capital of the world. And we're greeted by police officers wearing face masks. So if you're a citizen in Juarez, you probably wouldn't feel that safe knowing your police are so afraid of the drug cartels that they literally protect their identity with a mask. Now enter the internet. Uh, and Juarez is a reasonably connected society becoming more connected. You know, the population use their real names to report crimes and report what's happening. And for them, the internet is as good as a face mask because their version of a face mask is a large crowd of people. And like, what are you going to do if you're the cartels? Kill the entire population? No, you can't. You can't do that. Excellent. I think we're finished up. Oh, we've got, we've got one. What I want to do is one more question before we invite everyone upstairs. So my daughter's graduating from college this month. And I know it's great. I'm so excited, yes. And um, I think about the graduate, and I think about uh, the, the uh, talk that Dustin Hoffman got from, uh, from one of the characters when he said, I'm really worried about, I mean, I want to be remarkable in some way. I want to do something with my life. life. What kind of advice do you have? And he said, plastics. plastics. So I'm asking you, what kind of advice do you have? What is the current equivalent of plastics? Healthcare. Oh, really? Do you have to be a home health care worker? I mean, come on. Look, look. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> any reasonable analysis of America says that all the jobs in the future are going to be in health care. So I'm gonna, I've got to tell her health care, huh? Jared, you've got to tell her health care. No, I have a Don't you? I'm really, I'm not going to. I can't do that. I can't. You know, it's like, it's just health care sounds so um, bad, right? It's just like, <laughs> by the way, health care is pretty important. Especially I, well, if you're I'm totally. Sick. I get it. I get it. I understand it. <laughs> by the way, there's a, uh, and the serious <laughs> answer, the reason, yes. I, the reason I said health care is that the digital world will change healthcare in our country in remarkable ways. Uh, there is today an FDA approved pill that you can ingest that will Wi-Fi out the conditions of your stomach. If you, if, if you think I'm joking, look yeah. it up. On That's your a favorite, Twitter feed on, I want to follow. On your yeah. favorite search engine. Um, and so Wi-Fi is out to the phone, the phone figures out what's going on in your stomach, calls the doctor, the doctor calls you back and says get yourself into the hospital real quick. Uh, the revolution in sort of the combination of mobile phones and sort of personal monitoring is going to change healthcare forever. And I look at this slightly in a slightly different way. Um, I assume your, your daughter's 18, you know, 18 she's, years she's, old. She's just a little younger than you. She's 22. Okay. Oh, so, 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 sorry, sorry, just graduating college. Yeah. Now. Okay. So, so she's, yes. she's, she's 22. So basically, that whole generation and generations younger, they're the very first generation digital that native. are being socialized with high prevalence of technology. People, people describe yes. them as digital natives. And so whether they go into medicine, whether they become a professor, whether they go work at a business, it literally doesn't matter what their profession is. They will be supervised by people older than them who know less about technology than them. And every single one of them has an innate expertise that they don't realize is an expertise. So the biggest mistake that young graduates can make is not realizing they know more about technology than the people they're going to be working for, unless maybe they, they go and work for, for a tech company. And that's their comparative advantage, and they should use that strength in whatever field that they go into. And you know, the, the best way to sort of, if you're a parent, describe this to your kids is remind them how much you've learned from them and tell them to do that same kind of reverse mentorship in whatever workplace they go to. Love that. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you, Andre. Thank you.